uh, I, I have to confess there are a few things that I am now a little bit confused about. I, I should have confessed my confusion up front. Uh, I, I am not a, a, an intense student of realized eschatology. Uh, John will tell you that I've had to ask him for some clarification on some points. And apparently, there's a whole bunch of other points that I need more clarification on. Uh, you you dealt with Second Peter three. No, I didn't quite get that. Well, no, well, okay. You time. dealt with uh, my question on Second Peter three. You went to First Peter. Uh, did I understand you to say, to to suggest the idea that these are Jewish Christians rather than Gentile Christians? The Peter addresses the diaspora. That is correct. And so, well, that, okay, you, that's a yes. These are Jewish rather than Gentile yeah, so Christians. He, he is a minister to the circumcision okay. relations two eight and nine. All right. Yeah. Uh, again, I, primary, I, I, primary. Okay. I'm just saying I, I've explored tons of commentaries, etc., yeah. and uh, this is the first time I've encountered anyone who suggested that the audience of First and Second Peter was primarily Jewish rather than Gentile. Uh, but we'll set that aside for the moment. In uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll be there. They're still there. Uh, the third question that I asked. When Jesus said this in Luke chapter 20, uh, you, you responded by talking about spiritual death and spiritual resurrection and such, if I understood you correctly. Uh, however, Jesus here is responding to the argument of the Sadducees who reject the bodily resurrection. And so he is arguing for bodily resurrection and describing what it will be like in that resurrection. <clears throat> and so contextually, uh, this deals with the Sadducees' wrong idea. Let me uh, run, dash, hurriedly over a few more of these questions. Uh, we talked about this one briefly. The fifth question. The resurrection of the dead is a core doctrine of the New Testament mentioned in nearly every book. Some say that it happened in AD 70. Okay, we can't deny that it is shot through and through the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, do you get the point? The idea of the resurrection, the dead rising, however it wants to be described, the idea of the resurrection is shot through and through the New Testament. It is, in that sense, a core doctrine of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 24 and its parallels, we'll just call that the Olivet Discourse. Matthew chapter 24 is the central, most extensive passage in the New Testament describing the events of AD 70. There are other passages that seem to allude to it, but certainly don't go in depth about what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Matthew 24 and its parallels is the heart of it is a central passage on that subject. Now, if that is when the resurrection happened, have you noticed that there is not a peep about the resurrection in Matthew 24? Not mentioned once in the Olivet Discourse. Not once. How does one explain its absence being such a core doctrine in this central passage, this is the one doctrine I would expect not to be absent, but to be very present in Matthew 24, but it's not there. Another question. The earliest Christians from the post-apostolic period onward, because we are uh, not in agreement about what the apostles say, the earliest Christians from the post-apostolic period onward universally believed in a physical, bodily resurrection, similar, they compared it to, similar to Christ's resurrection. The question is, how did they all universally go so far wrong? Immediately, because there's no transition period. There's no period of a century or two where somebody is kind of toying with that, this idea that maybe the resurrection isn't going to happen and such, but instead, immediately, the earliest Christian writings, I'm talking from the 90s AD, speak of the bodily resurrection. How did they go so far wrong immediately, universally? Now, 
This is the type of reasoning that we use. Remember I talked about how we must be convinced by plain scripture and clear reasoning. This is the kind of reasoning that we use with doctrines that are peculiarly, uniquely ours in churches of Christ. We use this argument in regard to a cappella music. We point out that the early church never used instrumental music. It's not until centuries later that instruments were introduced. We use this argument in regard to baptism by immersion of adults. Infant baptism, sprinkling for baptism, is nowhere found in the early church writers. We use this argument also in regard to the Lord's Supper being observed every Sunday. Very few denominations do that. We point out to them that the early church did that. So we use this line of reasoning when we argue with denominations, and rightfully so. This is a good line of reasoning. This same line of reasoning tells us that since the early church universally believed in a physical bodily resurrection, how could they have gone so far wrong immediately 100% of it? Another question about Revelation. I love the book of Revelation. Uh, there are some who are not preterists who believe that Revel Revelation was written early, that is before 70 AD, and that the central theme in Revelation is the destruction of Jerusalem. My question to them and any who go that direction is this. When in history, in other words, written history, when in any of the writings of anybody when in history or in scripture is Jerusalem ever referred to as a city on seven hills or on seven mountains? When? And why would the Christians in the first century in Asia Minor, when they hear in Revelation 7 verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Why would any of them think of Jerusalem rather than Rome, because Rome is spoken of repeatedly in the classical writers, Virgil, Marshall, Cicero, and a host of others. Rome is spoken of as a city built on seven hills. When is Jerusalem ever spoken of that way? I know I've seen people go to the writings of Josephus and others and picked out from various passages seven different hills or mountains. That's not my question. Let me make it clear. The term, a city that sits on seven hills. When is that ever used for anything other than Rome in ancient times? How much time do I have? Uh, two minutes right now. All right, cool. About four more questions. <clears throat> Acts 1, verse 11. I said, I said, Acts 1, verse 11. It says uh, that they also said, the two angels said to the men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Question, was Jesus expected to come in the same way as they saw him ascend into heaven? Next question. John 5 verses 28 and 9, Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Question, when do the dead in the tombs rise? And associated with that, when do the wicked dead rise? Because Jesus speaks of that there in John 5. Uh, we've already spoken, or it's already been talked about a little bit, the question uh, that I have lined up next. So I'll jump ahead to uh, this one, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 7, where Paul says, so that you're not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Question, were the Corinthian Christians eagerly awaiting the destruction of Jerusalem? Why would they do that? Is there any mention of eagerness in Matthew 24? Matthew 24 talks about uh, distress, about tribulation, about fleeing for your life? Is there anything in there about joy or glee or eagerness on the part of the Christians in regard to the destruction of Jerusalem? Because Paul speaks about them being eager for the return of Christ. 
2 uh, Timothy 1, verse 12, and a host of other passages, Paul often speaks of that day. You're right at it, brother. Boom. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, answer all them. How about that? Thank you for your kind attention.